Good morning. A warm welcome to each one of you. If you're a visitor today, this is your first time, we warmly welcome you. If you haven't already taken advantage of a welcome pack that we have on the back table, please do so after the service. And for those of you who are regular attenders, make an effort to reach out to those you don't know and get to know them better. So just a few announcements for you before we have our call to worship this coming Thursday. As you know, this is Passion Week. Today's Palm Sunday. And this coming Thursday, we will get together as God's people and we'll celebrate a Monday Thursday service. We'll enjoy communion together as a church family. As you know, on the first Sunday of every month, we typically have communion together, but we will do that this coming Thursday. So and put that on your calendar. Make plans to attend this Thursday right here at this location, 7 o'clock. And then also for your calendar for Friday, April 9, not this coming Friday, but Friday, April 9, again, here at this location, we'll have our family Bible study at 7 o'clock. So make plans to attend that as well. And if you're a parent with young children, we remind you, as we have been in weeks past, that the kitchen back there is available if you need to attend to your little ones and have a place to take them. Also, we remind you that if you'd like a hymn book to have in your hand as we're singing, those are available as well, and the offering box is also available for you to give. So if you're able, please stand for the reading of God's Word. Our call to worship today is Psalm 118. I'll be reading verses 22 through 29. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. O oh Lord, do save, we beseech you. O oh Lord, we beseech you, do send prosperity. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has given us light. Bind the festival sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I give thanks to you. You are my God, I extol you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. This is God's word. Would you bow with me in prayer? Our Father, indeed, it is a privilege to be called your children, to be able to gather in this place freely to worship your name. And we pray that you would be pleased with our worship, that it would ascend to you as a sweet and pleasing aroma. May all that's done and said here, Father, point to the Lord Jesus, our Savior and our King. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Oh 
chapter 5. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them I heard saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. My soul, wait in silence for God only, for my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold. I shall not be shaken. So fun, right? 
rest in God alone, my rock and my salvation, a fortress strong against my foes, and I will not be shaken. Who lives may bless and hearts may curse, and lies like arrows pierce me. I'll fix my heart on able to remain standing for the reading of God's Word, please do so. Our scripture reading today is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21, 
Matthew 21, I'll be reading the first 11 verses. When they had approached Jerusalem and had come to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied there and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did just as Jesus had instructed them, and brought the donkey and the colt, and laid their coats on them, and he sat on the coats. Most of the crowd spread their coats in the road, and others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them in the road. The crowds going ahead of him and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes In the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. When he had entered Jerusalem, all the city was stirred, saying, Who is this? And the crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Would you bow with me in prayer? Lord God, our maker, And sustainer, you alone deserve all worship and praise. You are awesome in wonder, gloriously mighty, and you're in control of every detail from the decisions of kings and rulers to the movement and path of every tiny molecule or atom. Nothing escapes your notice and nothing is outside of your control. You do according to your good pleasure in heaven and on earth, and no one can ward off your hand or say to you, what have you done? We as your people gather together to bring you honor, to worship you, the one true and living God. We're thankful that you understand our frame that you know that we are but dust and that you don't treat your people as our sins deserve or reward us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is your loving kindness toward those who fear you. Thank you that because of Christ, you have removed and blotted out our sins as far as the east is from the west, never to be remembered again. This truth is too humbling and too wonderful to fully comprehend, but great is your name. King Jesus, we worship you and echo the words of those that we just read about. We shout Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And we desire that our praise would be real and authentic, For we know that these same people who were praising you one day were shouting for your crucifixion just a few days later. And may it not be said of us that we turned aside and rejected you. During this time of year, Lord Jesus, when we especially remember your days on this earth, it is so humbling to know that you chose to take on human flesh and for a time to lay aside the full rights and prerogatives of deity, to be the sin bearer for your people. May we have this same attitude in ourselves, doing nothing from selfish or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, let us regard one another as more important than ourselves, not looking out just for our own interest, but also for the interests of others. Thank you that you looked at us with pity and great love, seeing the desperate and lost condition we were in and taking the initiative to save us. 
For without this act of mercy on your part, we would be miserable, we would be lost and without any hope. Praise be to you, our Savior and our King. And because of your great love and care for your people, we come before you to lift up our request to you. Please meet the needs of your people that are gathered here today. Some are needing you to intervene in a health struggle, something that's been debilitating them for a long time. And we pray, Father, that you would be merciful and touch their bodies and meet that need. Some are greatly concerned over family struggles. And Father, we know that you care. You're tender-hearted and merciful toward us when we cry out to you. Some have financial needs. We acknowledge you that own the cattle on a thousand hills, and at any moment you can meet that need according to your riches and glory. Some need extra grace and strength to endure ridicule, persecution, perhaps on the job or in school. We pray for strength. Thank you that you are able to meet all these needs and so many more. And Father, we do look outside of these walls and we pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ who are suffering greatly. And we pray that you would uphold them and sustain them and we thank you for their example. We pray for those who are in authority so that we may lead quiet and peaceable lives in all godliness and dignity. We take comfort knowing the king's heart is like water in your hands. You turn it wherever you will. Thank you for answered prayer. Thank you for the hope that we have in Christ. Keep our hearts and minds set on eternity, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are unseen are eternal. And we say, come Lord Jesus, and we look forward to that day with great anticipation. And we humbly ask that you would bless the preaching of your word as our brother comes to open up the bread of life. Give us attentive minds receptive hearts. Father, may we hear from you. This is our prayer. We ask, Father, that you would grant us the desires of our heart according to your will. Thank you for hearing our prayers, for being our great King and Savior. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please be seated.
When all else fails, he still remains. Thank you for that reminder, our wonderful musicians. It is a joy and a privilege to be amongst God's people, and I praise God for his word, which reveals to us the glorious truths of our Lord. Today, we are remembering Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem to fulfill his mission of saving sinful men for himself. And when we think about Jesus entering Jerusalem for that final time, I think that we immediately recognize that he's only a few days away from being betrayed, that he's a few days from having his mock court trial, from being wrongly convicted, and then from being beat, spat on, and then ultimately being led to the hill of Golgotha, where he would be crucified. Palm Sunday is the beginning of Christ's sacrifice and death, when he bore the Father's wrath for those whom he came to save. The week of Jesus' passion, it is marked with great violence. But this Palm Sunday, in spite of all the violence that took place that week, I want us to see that Jesus entered into Jerusalem as the King of Peace. My message will be from Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. So if you have your Bibles, please open to Luke chapter 19. And the theme of our message is that Jesus is the King of Peace. Let's go ahead and read our text. It'll be Luke chapter 19, verses 28 through 40. Luke chapter 19, beginning at verse 28. After he had said these things, he was going on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he approached Bethphage and Bethany, near the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you. There, as you enter, you will find a colt tied 
on which no one yet has ever sat, untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent away, and so those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners said to them, Why are you untying the colt? They said, The Lord has need of it. They brought it to Jesus. They threw their coats on the colt and put Jesus on it. As he was going, they were spreading their coats on the road. As soon as he was approaching near the descent of Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles which they had seen, shouting, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But Jesus answered, I tell you, if these become silent, the stones will cry out. We are living in a fallen world because of man's sin. The world is cursed. Humans are born spiritually dead. They are enslaved to sin, enslaved to the devil. They're enslaved to their flesh. And thus, there are conflicts. There's violence. There are wars. All of humanity lacks peace. Fallen man have no peace with God. And therefore, they have no peace with one another. The only hope for humanity is that someone would come and bring peace. Someone would come and reconcile us. And historically, people tried to resolve conflicts by appointing a king. They would hope that a king would rule. A king would establish order. He would provide this peace. But so far, all of human kings failed. The prophets promised a future perfect king. And so the Jews, they are continuing to wait. They are still waiting for their promised Messiah. They're waiting for the son of David who would bring peace. Well, as Christians, we know that Jesus was and he is that promised king. Remember, before Jesus was born, the angel Gabriel, he appeared to Mary and he said, Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus, listen to this, he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Jesus came from heaven to this earth already being that king. And in today's text, in verse 38, we read that on that Palm Sunday, as Jesus entered Jerusalem, he was hailed as king who comes in the name of the Lord. We also read that he is the reason for peace, even peace in heaven. Why peace in heaven? What does that mean? Well, I want us to go through this passage and see that 
Jesus is the promised king, that he is the king of peace, and that he is worthy to be glorified and praised by all of us. Up until that Palm Sunday, Jesus hid his royal identity from people around him. Yes, he let his disciples know of who he was, but it was not to be revealed to anyone else until the proper time. You know, in his earthly ministry, Jesus performed many miracles. He healed the sick. He cast out demons. He even raised the dead. And the crowd, they often wanted to take and make him king, but Jesus prevented them from doing so. But let's observe how just a few days before his sacrifice, how Jesus now publicly reveals his true identity. The triumphant entrance into Jerusalem proved that Jesus was more than just a good man, that he was more than just a prophet who was powerful in word and in deed, and that he was and is the king in the full sense of the word. Look at our passage in verse 28. In verse 28, we see Jesus setting out to Jerusalem. Now, in Israel, Jerusalem was considered the sacred city of God. During the time of King David, Jerusalem was called Zion. It was distinguished by its beautiful walls and by the beautiful temple that was originally constructed by King Solomon. Now, why is Jesus heading to Jerusalem? Earlier in Luke chapter 18, verses 31 through 33, it says, Then he took the twelve aside and said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and all things which are written through the prophets about the Son of Man will be accomplished, for he will be handed over to the Gentiles. And he will be mocked and mistreated and spit upon. And after they have scourged him, they will kill him. And the third day, he will rise again. You see, Jesus had a mission that he came to fulfill. And he foretells his disciples why they're heading to Jerusalem. It will be the place where redemption will be accomplished. The significance of Jesus going to Jerusalem is seen only when one truly realizes that He is the promised King of the Old Testament. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 and 13, God spoke to David and He promised him. He said, when, you're, when your days are complete... When you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendant after you who will come forth from you, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. David was promised that he would have a descendant who will have a kingdom forever. And in human genealogy, Jesus was indeed a descendant of David. You know, during Christmas, we often remember God's promise through Isaiah, chapter 9, verse 6, which says, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Jesus, the Eternal Son of God, He came to this earth, born of a virgin. He is voluntarily fulfilling His mission. And so He sets out to Jerusalem as the King of Kings. He's going there as a king, and also he's going there as a sacrificial lamb. 
He knows that he's about to face his murderers. He knows that he's about to face his father's wrath. As the Lamb of God, his time of being slaughtered had arrived. Through his assassination, he will bear the Father's judgment and he will redeem his people for eternal glory. Now notice how Jesus in his earthly body, how he proved his sovereignty. In verses 29 and 30, we read that when he approached Bethphage and Bethany near the mound that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples saying, Go into the village ahead of you, and there as you enter, you will find a colt tied on which no one yet has ever set. Untie it and bring it here. Well, first of all, look at some of these places that are mentioned. Bethany was a village that Jesus often visited. It was about two miles away from Jerusalem. And friends like Lazarus, whom Jesus raised from the dead, and his two sisters, Mary and Martha, they lived in Bethany. Jesus and his disciples, they often stayed at the home of Martha. Now, the other village that's mentioned here is Bethphage, which is a village that was near Bethany. And we know that both Bethany and Bethphage, they were situated on Mount of Olives, Mount Olivet, which was right outside of Jerusalem. And according to Zechariah chapter 14, verses 3 and 4, Jesus will one day again return to Mount of Olives. He will return there to fight against the nations. We believe, the scripture teaches, from that day, Jesus will rule the world for a thousand years. But in today's text, we see King Jesus going to Jerusalem, not in royal robes, not in his full glorious display, Instead, he's dressed in regular Jewish clothes, and he's walking humbly with his disciples. And then in verse 30, we see Jesus sending his disciples to the village ahead of them and telling them, he tells them what they'll find. He foretells them what's going to be there in that village. And I want you to notice that Jesus displays his sovereignty in that he knows that they will find a colt, a donkey, which is tied. He tells them to untie it and then bring it to him. Jesus will enter into Jerusalem riding on a young donkey. Now, why does he need a donkey? Well, he needs it to fulfill an Old Testament prophecy. 500 years before Christ, the prophet Zechariah wrote, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Jesus needs a donkey. But imagine being one of the disciples who was sent out to that foreign village. Imagine being tasked with having to find a donkey that was tied and then having to untie it and then bring it to Jesus. Was it right for them to do this? Would you be brave? Would you be bothered by it? Well, look at verse 31. Jesus, again, he foretells them, If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say, the Lord has need of it. Now, this passage teaches us that Jesus not only foreknew what they will find there in that village, 
that the donkey was tied and they wouldn't go anywhere. But he also demonstrates his sovereignty in that he knows that they were going to be stopped and that they were going to be questioned about what they were doing. And the disciples, they were just to trust and obey, believing that everything will work out. Jesus knows exactly who will stop them. He knows exactly what the disciples will face. And therefore, he instructs them to say, the Lord has need of it. You see, Jesus is more than just a human king. He's divine. I want to stop here for a few minutes and expound on what Jesus meant when he said that he was the Lord, when he identified himself as the Lord. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word for Lord was Adonai, and it often referred to God, to the creator of the universe. We won't have time to look at all the passages. There are so many, but we'll just look at a couple. In Genesis chapter 15, verse 2, Abraham referred to God as Lord. In Genesis chapter 15, verse 8, the Lord is identified as God. In Exodus 23, verse 17, God identifies himself as Lord. In Joshua chapter 3, verse 11, Joshua refers to the Ark of the Covenant as the Ark of the Lord. In Joshua chapter 3, verse 13, we see that the Lord God is the Lord of all the earth. Psalm 97, verse 5 shows how all nature is subject to to the Lord of all the earth. Well, in the New Testament, the Greek word for Lord is kurios. And it also was often used to refer to God. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 25, we read, At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to infants. In Luke chapter 4, verse 18, Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recover of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed. In Revelation chapter 4, verse 8, we see a scene from heaven which, which says, And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes around and within, and day and night they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty who was, and who is, and who is to come. Returning back to our text today in Luke chapter 19, when Jesus calls himself Lord, he signifies a position of authority, a position of superiority, and a position of divine ownership. He is the Lord, to whom all are subject to. So the donkey ultimately belonged to the Lord. And it will obediently come to Jesus, the sovereign king of the universe. Jesus is the king. And everyone is obligated to submit to his word. Beloved, the implication for us here is that we are to submit to Him and to every word that He says. We are not lords of our lives. Instead, He's Lord and we are to trust and obey Him. Looking back again at our text, 
I want us to see how the Lord's entrance into Jerusalem proved His divinity. Jesus said, Jesus sent His disciples to get a colt. A colt is a young donkey. In the Old Testament, uh, the donkey, this was the choice animal for royalty. It was preferred by kings and princes, and it was a symbol of authority. In Judges chapter 10, verse 4, we see that Jair the Gilead, he judged Israel and that he had 30 sons who rode on 30 donkeys. Later on in Judges chapter 12, verse 14, we see that Abdon, the son of Hillel, who judged Israel, he had 40 sons and 30 grandsons who rode on 70 donkeys. In 1 Samuel chapter 25, verse 42, we see King Nabal's wife, Abigail, we see that she also rode on a donkey. Well, now we're going back to our text in verse 30 of chapter 19. We see that Jesus emphasized that he needed a, a donkey that no one has yet ever set on. He needed a donkey that had not been used, that, not, that had not been corrupted. It had to be fit for a sacred purpose, sacred mission. Now, why was it so important for the Lord to ride into Jerusalem on a new donkey? It was important because He is the divine King. He has preeminence in everything. You see, Jesus was the firstborn. He was born of a virgin. When Jesus dies, He would be buried in a new tomb in which no one had previously laid in. As the divine King, as the Creator, he needed a new donkey. Jesus deserves the newest and the best. And with this action, Jesus reveals his true heavenly divine identity. Well, after the disciples brought the donkey to Jesus, verses 35 and 36 state, that they threw their coats on the colt, they put Jesus on it, and as he was going, they were spreading their coats on the road. The disciples, they threw their robes on the donkey, they created this saddle for Jesus to set on, and then when Jesus begins to ride into Jerusalem, we see the others in the crowd, they start spreading their clothes on the road before Jesus. They're making this triumphal carpet for him, their actions, they showed their reverence for the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. In verses 37 and 38, we read that as soon as he was approaching near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice. For all the miracles which they had seen, shouting, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, Luke's description is brief here. But we know from Matthew and the other gospel writers how the crowd also took palm branches and how they waved them and how they shouted words like, Hosanna. And then they shouted, Hallelujah. The crowd is rejoicing because many who used to be ill are now healthy. Jesus had healed them. They're praising God because they see Lazarus alive whom Jesus rose from the dead. Jesus is indeed the divine king. Beloved, we are remembering 
how Jesus' triumphant entrance into Jerusalem, how it proved his true identity. As Jesus entered into Jerusalem, the Old Testament prophecy of Zechariah 9, 9, chapter 9, verse 9, it was perfectly and accurately fulfilled. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Jesus is king. He's endowed with salvation. Now, what are the implications for us here? Don't miss this. Don't miss this. He brings salvation because he is the divine king of peace. Jesus is the divine king of peace. Remember when Jesus was born? A host of angels appeared to the shepherds. The shepherds were out there in the field and then the the angels, they appeared and they started to praise God. And they said, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. Jesus' birth, it brought peace to this earth. Because of Jesus' reign, there will certainly be peace among men. Now, I think it's beautiful to see how this peace was exemplified on that Palm Sunday. When Jesus entered into Jerusalem, we could see how he brought this peace. Throughout this passage, in Luke chapter 19, we see how Christ has all man's hearts in his sight and in his hand. Perhaps you have heard that Jesus cannot cause us humans to act a certain way. Well, that is not true. He has dominion over all creatures. He could cause them to act as he sees fit. As he pleases. Now, we already saw the miracle of how the untrained donkey, how this new young colt who's never been trained, how he obeys and he follows the disciples back to Jesus. How this donkey obeyed Jesus when he got on it. And how it obediently carried Jesus into Jerusalem. But I also want you to notice how a conflict was avoided between the disciples and those who questioned them for untying the donkey. Look back at verse 31. We saw Jesus foretell his disciples that there will be some... Some there who will question what they were doing. They'll question them why they're untying this colt. And Jesus assured them that everything will will be okay. Everything will work out when they answer that the Lord has need of it. And in verse 32, we saw that everything was just as Jesus foretold them. In a parallel passage in Mark chapter 11, verse 4, we see that they went away and they found a colt tied at the door, outside in the street, and they untied it. In verse 33 of our text, we saw that, we saw that the owners of the colt, that they were indeed concerned with disciples untying their colt. Now, this naturally would be a reason for a conflict. Surely, uh, the owners of the colt and the donkey, they had value in these donkeys. And they could have insisted that they leave the colt alone. You could imagine that the disciples would probably begin to argue with these owners But no conflict arose. In verse 34, we read that they simply answered as Jesus Jesus instructed them that the Lord has need of it. Now, 
Why was there no conflict? Why was there no conflict? Because Jesus is king and he provided peace. In that situation, Jesus showed that he could move in people's hearts. He influenced those to whom the donkey and the colt belonged to. As David earlier prayed, the king's heart is like streams of waters in the hands of the Lord. And the Lord turns it wherever he wants. And notice how in our text, the owners willingly, they just consented to the disciples taking the donkeys to Jesus. All the disciples had to do was faithfully obey the Lord's instruction. And the Lord was faithful to provide them literal peace. Beloved, perhaps you are facing a conflict with a loved one. Are you facing a potential conflict with someone at work? With someone at school? Perhaps even in the church? Look at our text and see that Jesus is the king of peace. Obey what his word teaches us. Remember, he's able to provide peace between you and others. Now, as Christians, we are called to seek peace. Paul, in Romans chapter 12, verse 17 and 18, he instructs fellow Christians, saying, Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men, if possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Well, not only is Jesus the reason for peace amongst men, not only did Jesus bring peace on this earth. Look at verse 38 of our text, Luke chapter 19, verse 38. We read that as Jesus was entering Jerusalem, the people, they were moved to shout, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace. In heaven and glory in the highest. Jesus brings peace to earth. But why did they rejoice and proclaim that there's peace in heaven? Why should we take note of this clause? What does it mean that there's now peace in heaven? I think it's important for us to remember that at one time, there arose a rebellion amongst angels in heaven. Revelation chapter 12, verse 7 through 9, gives us a description of what happened. It says, And there was war in heaven, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. The dragon and his angels waged war, and they were not strong enough. And there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Scripture tells us that, that a third of the heavenly hosts, they waged war in heaven. And also that they were defeated. But now, but now, we are to rejoice because there's perfect peace in heaven. And this peace is permanent. There will always be peace in heaven. In addition, because of the fall, God used to be at enmity with man. But now that the Messiah has come, Christ, the King, provides peace in heaven between God and man. 
Jesus, the Son of Man. He is our human representative who is now in heaven and who grants us this perfect peace with God. On Palm Sunday, Jesus entered into Jerusalem to save His people from their sins. Beloved, salvation provides that perfect peace with God. It provides peace for us to have amongst each other. And salvation also brings peace to our hearts. And if you lack peace today, it may be that you still don't know Christ, the King. But if you do have faith in Jesus as Lord, if you have been changed internally, then look at what He's already granted to you. He has granted to you peace. Jesus is the King of peace who is now worthy of all of our praise. In verse 37, we read about how the crowd began to praise God, how they joyfully shouted with a loud voice. Let me ask you, do you truly recognize today Jesus as your divine King? Are you internally rejoicing and praising God for His salvation? In Matthew chapter 21, we read that people also shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David. Now this word Hosanna means, save us now. And this phrase, this clause, save us now, is taken out of Psalm 118 verse 25. The crowd were shouting, Hosanna. They understood that their Messiah was now here. And that is why they referred to him as the son of David. In our verse 38, we see them praising Jesus as the blessed king who comes in the name of the Lord. Now this was the highest way which Jesus could have been praised. He is acknowledged by His followers as the promised deliverer. At the end of verse 38, we see them proclaiming, Glory in the highest! The people rejoiced. They praised God for His goodness. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Beloved, today our hearts are to also rejoice. Look at what God had accomplished through His Son, Jesus. Let us praise Him. He's blessed forever. Glory to the Most High God. Redemption has come. Through the King of Peace. Christ has reconciled all things to Himself. Things in heaven and things on earth. Well, what if this Palm Sunday, you don't have joy in your heart? Are you irritated by our text? Are you annoyed that Christians are rejoicing today? Well, look at verse 39. Verse 39, we read, Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. As Jesus entered into Jerusalem, every Pharisee, seeing him on a donkey, they became aware of the messianic pro uh, promises, messianic prophecies. The Pharisees, they were teachers of Israel. And they opposed Jesus and his claim that he and the Father are one. And so they were annoyed that Jesus was being praised. They were concerned that Jesus was getting too much attention. But they failed to see right before them 
the promised divine Messiah. They failed to see the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. They tried to silence the crowd. But even in that, they failed. So they turned to Jesus. And they commanded him to rebuke his disciples. Now with such attitude, it becomes clear. They proved it themselves that they were enemies of Christ. They were enemies of his kingdom. You see, inwardly, they were proud. They hated to see Jesus being affirmed as their Lord and as their King. Notice, the Pharisees did not submit to the King of Peace. And therefore, they had no peace. They had strife in their hearts. Well, look at how Christ responds to them in verse 40 of our text. It says, but Jesus answered, I tell you, if these become silent, the stones will cry out. Whether Jesus' followers hold their peace or not, he shall, he must, and he will be praised. If these become silent, if these stop praising God for the Messiah, then immediately the stones will begin to cry out. But be assured, regardless, Christ the King will be praised. Now, what did Jesus mean when he said the stones will cry out? Was he just joking? Was he using a figure of speech? No. You see, Jesus, the Son of God, he was serious. How can the stones cry out? Well, remember, Jesus is God. Jesus is the creator of this universe. He caused Balaam's donkey to speak a human language. He causes the sea to roar. He causes the volcanoes to erupt in this tremendous noise. He causes the earth to quake and the mud to slide, which also create this awesome and this terrifying sound. And if the Lord's people stop praising Him, the stones will begin to cry out. Now, this actually did literally happen just a few days later when Jesus breathed His last breath on the cross. His disciples, they were hiding in silence. At that silent moment of Jesus' death, the earth did begin to quake, and the stones cried out. Tombs were open, and people ran for their lives in terror. In his triumphant entrance, Jesus rebuked the Pharisees, saying that it would be impossible for his followers to remain quiet. If Christians refrained from praising God, if circumstances could silence the Lord's followers, then the gospel would be suppressed. Every natural disaster should remind humanity of the praise that our Lord deserves. Jesus' reply to the Pharisees, it showed that he accepted the people's praise. It was indeed appropriate for him the divine king of peace. He is Israel's promised king who is to be worshipped. Beloved, we are remembering our Lord's entrance into Jerusalem. And I don't want this to be just an informational exposition. I want us to see why this text is important for us and how we're to respond how we're to think, and how we're to behave. Jesus, the divine king, he willingly went into Jerusalem to suffer and to die for us. 
he went forward without hesitation. He knew very well what would take place in Jerusalem. He knew what would happen to him there. And yet, he went into Jerusalem determined, as though he longed for it. He saw the joy set before him, and he willingly went in to endure the cross, despising the shame so that he would bring peace to his people. If Jesus so willingly endured such violence to grant us peace with him, can we not endure our temporal sufferings for him and his sake? Because of Jesus' triumphant entrance, the humiliation of his death became even more significant. You see, the King of Kings, the Prince of Heaven, he emptied himself. He came to earth to reconcile sinners to God because of what he has done. Beloved, we can have peace on earth and we will have eternal peace in heaven. Having redeemed man to himself, Jesus ascended back to heaven. But a day is coming when Jesus again will return in power and he will come to receive for himself his full kingdom. If you are not part of His kingdom today, you must bow your knee today and give homage to the King. You must kiss His scepter lest He be angry with you. Repent and surrender your life to Him or you will be rightly judged for your rejection. Well, as his followers, we must remember the peace that our king has achieved for us. And as a response, we must joyfully praise him throughout all of our lives. Let us praise him through all of our circumstances. Let us praise him through all of our sufferings. May the Holy Spirit help us to faithfully do so. If you're able, would you rise, prayer? Oh, Father, we are so grateful to be reminded of our King, Lord Jesus, the divine Messiah who came to this earth to provide peace for us sinners. Thank you that His triumphant entrance into Jerusalem It proved beyond shadow of a doubt that He is who He said He was. That He is the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and that He is the King of peace. Father, we know that there are here today some who do not know You as Lord and Savior, who have not experienced Your love, who have not surrendered their lives to You and to Your glory. Father, we ask that you would draw them to Christ, that they may see the love of Jesus, his sacrifice for them, and that they would repent and believe in the gospel. We thank you, Lord, for this week that we will celebrate the Lord's promise of his covenant to his church, and then his suffering and death as a sacrifice as a propitiation for our sins, and then His resurrection to prove that His sacrifice was accepted and that He attained victory for us. Father, may our hearts be overfilled with joy this this day and this week and all of our lives, and that others in our community may see this glorious light that shines through us. It is in Christ's name that we ask these things. Amen.
you to take your seats for a couple of minutes. In scripture, we read about how God establishes his church, how he sets up the order in the church, how he sets up leadership in the church, and all of that is very important. 
to be a biblical church, we must obey and uh, follow the instructions that God has given to us. We also read in Scripture that each one of us has a gift. There is no one here who possesses every gift, and there is no one who has no gift. Everyone has a gift. And so each one of us is to use our gift for the edification of the body, the church. Everyone is to serve in some way. If you don't know what your gift is, you could come perhaps see either David or myself. He could pray with you, talk to you about you know, how the Lord gifts us and provide opportunities for you to serve. Well, within a church, God has also established shepherds, or as we call them, elders slash pastors, and also deacons. As you know, we have Tom McMillian as one of our deacons, who has been faithful, serving, uh, he's, he's been trustworthy, but we also want to recognize today Paul Hilkovich as a fellow deacon as well. I want to read to you 1 Timothy chapter 3 from verses 8 through 13. Deacons, likewise, must be men of dignity, not double-tongued or addicted to much wine or fond of sordid gain, but holding to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. These men must also first be tested, then let them serve as deacons if they are beyond reproach. Women must likewise be dignified, not malicious gossips, but temperate, faithful in all things. Deacons must be husbands of only one wife and good managers of their children and their own households. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a high standing and great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Beloved, um, we as elders, David Sacrum, myself, and Dave Amandus, we have observed Paul's faithfulness throughout all these years. I'm sure you have observed it as well, how he faithfully serves you, the church, serves us, how he helps us out. And examining his life, we recognize that he fits this description of a biblical deacon. And so this past week, us elders and Tom and Paul, we met, and we prayed for Paul, thanking the Lord for his service, for his ministry, and we want to officially recognize him today in front of you, the church. Paul, thank you for your service. We pray that you would continue to be faithful, ministering. May God give you the strength. May God bless Vitlana as she helps out and ministers to you. And thank you for all that you do for us, Gospel of Grace. Amen. Well, receive this benediction before we depart. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. May God bless you. Have a wonderful week. And if you are a visitor today, please stick around. We'd like to get to know you a little bit better.